Hey everybody, this is Issa Betancourt, your host of The Bug Scope. Oh, let me try to fit here in portrait mode. Usually we do this in landscape mode, but we're trying something different with this broadcast today. So welcome to the broadcast. Uh, today I'm very excited to bring on some two special guests who just recently published a paper on the effect of fire on insects. And not only are these guests uh, really awesome and um, scientists. They're also friends of mine. I've known them for like getting close to 10 years now. Um, so with, uh, without further ado, do, I will bring them on. Here we go. Hey. Welcome Vaughn and Steve. So Vaughn is a current PhD candidate. He's in the lower right here. Um, in the Reese Lab of Butterfly Informatics of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., the research interests include the impact of global change processes on arthropod communities, particularly those of alpine, arctic, and boreal ecosystems. Vaughn is particularly interested in the use of museum collections, archives, and photography to answer these questions. Outside of research, Vaughn is a huge fan of punk and techno music, as well as local drag artists. So welcome, Vaughn, to the broadcast. So great to have you here. Thank you, sir. And then in the lower left is Dr. Steve Mason, and I am emphasizing the doctor because Steve defended his PhD just like a week and a half ago over at Drexel University. Um, Steve's research has focused on the effects of insect communities, um, oh, fire on the effects of insect communities at the macro scale, which we'll be talking about today and also at the local scale in the New Jersey Pine Barrens and Valley Forge National Historical Parks. Park. His goals are to help conservation managers make more informed decisions and predictions that involve biodiversity. This fall, it's very exciting, Steve begins a tenure track position. He's an assistant professor at Immaculata University in Pennsylvania. And in his free time, Steve enjoys naturalizing in new places, working on jigsaw puzzles and playing Pokemon Go. So welcome, guys, to the broadcast. Thank you. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, how introduction on the personal note is that I first met Steve uh, in the collection, one of the first people I met at the academy uh, in the entomology department. And he and I co-managed a species, a specimen, a collection-wide specimen inventory of the entomology collection and that took like four years so that was pretty solid and then Vaughn I met he was an undergraduate researcher uh, who started working in the collection and working pretty closely with my supervisor Dr. John Gale House on some um, first you were a co-op and then you started doing some extra research projects on uh well, a couple of different things, I guess, right, Vaughn? Uh, first, yeah. crane, crane flies, which is ongoing. And then yeah. also, you did a yeah, really so cool... Yeah, go crane ahead. Crane flies, databasing, biodiversity informatics. Yeah, I got really into insects during that time period. So. And you even got a tattoo to prove it. I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Vaughn, were, were you an undergrad when you published that type uh, collection paper? I was just out of undergrad. Uh, close yeah. enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the paper where you looked at like the type collection and how and like kind of the trends of who was collecting and also when the most specimens were collected and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, so we were looking at like how the history of the collection basically created the collection in terms of its like taxonomic diversity so what types of species were actually there and who was working in the collection at that time so it's a cool right. paper yeah it was yeah yeah your visuals are really cool too um yeah cool so the motivation for bringing you guys on today is that you both are you represent half of the four of the total authors two of the four authors and Steve is the first author on this paper that was published recently in um, Biological Con Conservation in that scientific journal. And so I wanted to bring you on. It's a really interesting paper because it's about fires, which when you think of a fire, you think, oh, no, like everybody, like 
this is bad. We think of the Amazon fires. We think of the fires out west. We think of the fires in Australia. Um, and so um, I think it, this is an exciting opportunity for us to discuss what fires mean for biodiversity and specifically insect biodiversity and to get just a deeper understanding of that and learn more about your paper and what you've uncovered in your research. Yeah, I, so you set it up real well, Isa. I think the important thing is here, I think humans in general just kind of feel fires are bad, fires are devastating, you know, stuff like that. And humans don't really benefit from fire, you know, because it kills people and destroys property. But there are thousands of species that actually rely on fire because after a fire, it creates dead wood. Um, there's more open space. Um, you know, there's more nutrients into the soil. So a lot of species actually rely on that. Um, and at least with the paper, um, what Vaughn, myself, Lauren Panicio uh, of the University of Oregon and John Gelhouse um, at Drexel University, we all wanted to look at fire mechanisms on how bees, butterflies, and ground beetles um, are affected. And fire mechanisms are not just overall fire, but like fire severity, the seasonality of the fire, stuff like that. Um, and I think that was really the, maybe the meat of the dissert, uh, not dissertation, but the publication that uh, actually came out. So Vaughn, anything else to add to that? Yeah, no, I think that's beautiful. You're the fire ecologist here. So I think that was a great summary. Um, yeah, Steve reached out to me to do this paper. Was it like two years ago? Two, two and a half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and it was, it was a, a beast of a paper, but we're really glad that it's out and we really think we found some, some cool and insightful things, not just in terms of insect ecology, but also in terms of like where the field of disturbance ecology or fire ecology might want to focus, you know, moving forward. So, yeah. Super cool. Yeah. So do you guys, do you want to? Will you like tell us the story of the process of putting this paper together, like what your inspiration for it was, and then a little bit about your methods and Yeah, um, it's a two and a half year project. So it, it was definitely a long time. But going back, um, you know, this was the first chapter of my dissertation. And originally, I was going to write a review paper like on fire effects on insects. Um, and then kind of when I started out in that process, I quickly realized like a lot of publications show conflicting results in the literature, meaning that like I could provide you 20 papers that say fires are good on insects and 20 papers that say fires bad on insects. Um, and one of the papers that I read early in my career was by Rachel Winfrey. She's a professor at Rutgers University and she did a meta analysis, which I never heard of at the time. Um, but it's basically an analysis that takes all the results from every publication that you could find and combines them um, into one like ultimate result. And it's usually a binary question that meta-analysis answers. And in this case, is fire good or fire bad? Um, so then I reached out to Vaughn and I was like, hey, Vaughn, you're a stats person. You know, I feel like I'm more natural history field work and writing. Um, and I was like, have you done a meta-analysis before? And then Vaughn said. <laughs> yeah, I said, no, I haven't. <laughs> um, yeah, that's actually funny. Steve and I were just talking about this the other day. Like we, with this paper, we like literally came from nothing in terms of our knowledge of how to do a meta-analysis and really built it from the ground up, which was like a great learning process for the both of us, I think. So, yeah. For cool. sure. And and at some point, um, uh, Dr. Lauren Panicio, again, uh, a co-author on the paper at University of Oregon, um, you know, her and I connected at a conference. It was actually at um, ICE, uh, so Entomological Society of America in Orlando, Florida, the biggest conference of entomologists ever. We connected there, um, and I quickly learned that she's published on meta-analyses before. So then when Vaughn and I started the project, I kind of reached out to her and I was like, what do you think? And she was all for it. And she pro provided like amazing oversight in, um, in the writing and the analysis and stuff like that. So, so you met her back in 2016. That's when the international conference was, which was right around the time that the bug scope was born. Just wanted um, to acknowledge that. <laughs> so, and yeah. just to put something in perspective, um, at that conference, you know, the largest gathering of entomologists, there were literally thousands of presentations, but there was only three on fire effects on insects and two posters. So five kind of 
projects total within thousands on fire effects on insects. So it kind of like shows we need more research in that field. No bias, I promise. <laughs> yeah, and to give people a sense of scale too, there were, I believe, 7,000 entomologists there in attendance. So that was the greatest assembly of entomologists in the history of the world. Um, yeah, so we have two uh, sort of introductory questions here in the chat. Um, will you remind us of the definition of boreal, Steve? Uh, yeah, so I actually, I'm going to direct that one to Vaughn because yeah. boreal forest is <laughs> Vaughn's topic. Yeah, I mean, there's, so boreal and Arctic, I think there's various definitions for them. There's geopolitical definitions, whatever. Um, the definition that I use is, um, you know, any forest that is primarily coniferous stands and is highly seasonal. So you get those really extreme dark winters. Um, but there are people can have used latitudinal definitions, you know, if it's above this latitude, um, there's all sorts of things. So that's a great question. Um, but that's the definition that, that I use for my research. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize that was a video. <laughs> <laughs> So, so maybe we can talk about it now. Yeah, the, um, <laughs> so one of the fire makers. Wait, that, one moment. Let me turn the volume down. Okay. The, vol okay. the volume's cool though. Um, that is cool. <laughs> so one of the common, uh, one of the fire mechanisms that we looked at um, in the paper was actually wildfire and prescribed fire. And that's like a really common question in ecology. If you're studying fires, like what's the difference between prescribed fires and wildfires? Um, so in the video, it's actually a prescribed fire in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, um, purposely set by the New Jersey Forest Fire Service. Um, and prescribed fires are purposely set fires um, for different land management goals. Um, and in this case, it's to reduce the fuel load um, because when a wildfire does come through, um, everything's already burned because we prescribed burned it. Um, and at least what we found, I don't know if the results are up, but uh, let's see, the richest? Um, prescribed fires um, and wildfires, there are some differences, um, but it really depends on what you're looking at, like taxa-wise. Are you looking at butterflies? Are you looking at bees? Um, and of course, you know, is bee richness different than butterfly abundance per se? Um, so I'm going in a lot of different directions, but there are differences, but there are also similarities. Mm -hmm. um, oh, quickly, uh, with this fire, so, that was about 10 meters, 20 meters on like a normal size, uh, normal size road, like a two um, lane road. I was actually on the other side of that fire um, and my hand was actually out with the camera and I couldn't take a longer video because the heat was, it was so hot, even though I was on the opposite side of a two lane road. Um, and you could actually hear the, you know, the um, consumption going on uh, from that actually prescribed fire. Yeah. That's a really cool video, Steve. I almost want to leave it up as like the banner video <laughs> when people come in, like they see what we're talking about sort of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, there's a mention here in the chat from Meron that today 40 soldiers died in Algeria fighting wildfires, which is like really sad and oh, no. tragic. And that does sort of bring up the question in my mind of like, I think it's helpful for us to, um, maybe you guys know more about, about this than I do, but like with all the fires going on in the world right now that have like gotten out of control, like is that, what's what's the deal with that? Like is that natural or not natural? And like all the destruction coming from it and just like, yeah, just if you're I, able to comment on that. Um, I think I'll, I'll definitely defer to Vaughn as well but what the first thing that comes to my mind is we have to keep in mind wildfires are natural um literally every terrestrial habitat at some point had a fire right uh historically and currently um what really matters is the severity and the frequency of that fire uh parts of australia parts of california the new jersey pine barrens is a high fire frequency area so we get wildfires more commonly um, than the boreal forests in canada for example but with climate change, fires are becoming more severe, more frequent, um, and they're extend, you know, expanding a greater area. They're burning a greater area than historically. Um, 
So that I think is what's new in ecology now is that fires are natural, but what we're seeing now with climate change might not be, you know, might not be historically and evolutionary natural. Um, mm -hmm. Vaughn, you know, you got anything? Yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to riff off of that. I mean, I think the term natural is really difficult to define um, because I think we've modified our environments so much, um, whether through, you know, habitat destruction or conversion and and climate change that, um, yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't say that anything is really natural, right? You could have a natural ignition source like lightning or, or something, but um, yeah, you know, I just flew back uh, to DC from Washington state and in every single flight that I was in, I mean, we took off in really high density wildfire smoke. Um, and from what I recall, most of the fires that were out there where I was were had some sort of human cause of ignition. Um, and so that's always a concern too, I think. Yeah, 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 for sure. And last, when I defended my dissertation, I actually put like a fun fact in there. Um, at least two weeks ago, there was 21,000 wildland firefighters out in out west currently trying to uh, fight the wildfires out there. And that's 21,000. So that's basically we're sending in troops to fight a war, a wildfire war, you know, to protect our homes and our lives. And it's, I never knew it was that high. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting thing to like, I'm sure that there's a lot more conflict with wildfires too, with like the expansive humans, like building all over the place as well. And yeah. so then there's more conflict and a trickier balance of trying to maintain and maintain ecosystems, but then also like make sure there's not too much of a load that gets starts burning and yeah, just the, the balance gets really complicated, which is um, also why like understanding fires more in their role is so important to figure out how best to approach these situations and how to manage them. Um, yeah. So um, hi, Peter. Hi, Maya. And hi, David. Um, okay. So yeah, could, can we dive into a little bit of, I guess some of the highlights of what you guys found and then maybe backtrack to be like, how, how did you come across to get those conclusions? If that, if that, if, the, if you think that works as a way to um, discuss your paper's yeah, findings. Totally. Um, where do we want to start? I mean, I think we could start with looking at one of the forest plots, Steve, and just walking people through that, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Do I, do I just click on this and see what happens? Yeah, I think we bring it sure. up. Did I bring something? Wrong one. <laughs> Me wrong? Oh, this one. Oh, yeah, thanks. that one. No problem. Wait. Um, I think you took it off the screen. This one. Yeah. Okay. So cool. I'm wondering, is there a way to make it bigger? Yeah. 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 Here, I'll, I'll take care of that one sec. Okay, cool. You're the expert really? here. <laughs> Boom. Oh, sweet. It's awesome. still small for us, but well, it, let's for see if viewers, I can zoom it's bigger. In on the screen. Okay, I can zoom in on the screen, so that's cool. Cool. Um, yeah, I'll let on. you take it. I'll let you take it away, Steve. No, no, no you, you made this. This. <laughs> okay, I did make it. It's totally fair. Um, I'm gonna make so, one yeah. adjustment, but keep on talking. Okay, sounds good. So, yeah, so this is one of the the figures from our plot, and Steve, you'll have to. Uh, remind me again whether it was richness or abundance that came first in this figure. Richness on the but, left, I think. Um, thank you. Um, but essentially, this, this is the sort of output that we're getting from our from our study. Um, and so what you see here is you see, you know, panel A and panel B. We'll talk about panel A first. Um, you see this, this line on the bottom. That's our effect size um, or estimated effect size for those fire variables. Um, and then you see these lines for each one of these categories. So we have wildfire, prescribed fire, growing season fires, dormant season fires, et cetera. Um, and what's important to note here is um, A, if that line for each one of those variables is crossing the dotted zero line, right? Um, and B, which site, if they're not crossing zero, right? 
which side of um, that dotted zero line they're falling on, right? So as I mentioned before, this is the figure, the results that we found for, for bees. Um, and what we see here is that um, there's a lot of actually positive effects of fire on um, bee richness. So how many bee species are there um, in the communities that were sampled? Um, if we look at panel B, you can also see that um, there's also a lot of positive effects of fire in general, generally speaking, um, on bee abundance. So how many bees are there in the community that was sampled, right? Um, and so the colors here are also sort of telling an interesting story as well. So um, we've grayed out the ones that cross zero. So that means that um, there's some chance that um, there's really no effect there. Um, but the blue um, lines we're pretty confident about. Um, so we did a sensitivity analysis where we removed um, different studies from our bigger study um, individually. And then we reran our model to see um, if, you know, maybe one study contributed um, to an effect overwhelmingly or, or what have you. And so um, things in orange, um, when we did that replacement um, strategy, um, they, at, with the removal of one or two um, studies, actually did cross zero. So those are results that we're saying are significant overall, but that they're sensitive in terms of, um, you know, what studies we included in our analysis. Um, but the blue ones, we have a pretty good um, grasp on them. And we think that they're definitely, um, there's some true signal there in terms of all of these um, fire variables and their impacts and site variables too, right? We're looking at things like broadly forest, coniferous forest, right? Um, is fire acting differently towards or, you know, are the responses of bee communities in broadly forest different than in coniferous forests when a fire moves through, stuff like that. Um, and so that's, the bees were our, I think our most exciting story that came out of this. Um, and we can talk about some of the other things in terms of like, um, you know, moving the field forward in terms of like what data need to be collected um, in order to have a really robust um, sampling design. But um, that's like the overall summary of, of some of the exciting bee results that we found. Yeah, so kind of like on a manager or a conservation manager perspective, if we look at, you know, A, right? Well, it's hard to, this thing keeps moving the figure on me. <laughs> um, if we look at A, so column A on the left, the first thing we see is wildfire and prescribed fire. So that's an example where we actually broke down the overall fire effect to just take out, to just look at wildfire studies and prescribed fire studies. And again, this is on B richness. So as what Vaughn said, the lines to the right of that is the effect size, um, but we could actually see that they're gray. So there's no effect on B richness for wildfire or prescribed fire. So if a land manager is asking, What's the difference between wildfires and prescribed fires on bee richness? Well, they could actually go to the paper and be like, there's actually no positive or negative effect. But at least the mean effect, the average, um, that little circle there is actually more positive. And I hope that made sense. So if we look at column B, if we break down bee abundance, that's column B, bee abundance. If we break down wildfires or prescribed fires, we could actually see, you know, land manager, hey, what's the what's the difference between wildfires and prescribed fires on bee abundance? Well, there is no difference because they both significantly increase bee abundance, right? Um, so that's kind of how you read this figure. Um, and you kind of could go down to look at every fire and site characteristic um, and hopefully make better uh, predictions and uh, you know management decisions um, by having this foundation. Uh, and the foundation is every bee and fire study that we could actually find which was a lot. We had 292 publications for all three taxa that we used. Hope yeah. that made sense. I think that also kind of leads us into like, how the heck did we do this too, right? Yeah. Um, so Steve mentioned like in the beginning, like talking about how a meta-analysis is sort of like a summary of prior studies, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, Steve, God bless Steve. He went through <laughs> multiple literature databases to find a whole bunch of studies um, relevant to fire and all the different um, taxa that we studied. 
um, and him and I went through them study by study and determined if we could use the data in the study um, based on the study design, based on the type of data that, that were collected, um, all of that. So I don't know, Steve, if you want to talk more about that process or... Yeah, sure. Like we, we jumped ahead with the results, but I think um, in order to do a meta-analysis, the first thing you need to do is a systematic literature search. Wait, so can you, system, excuse yeah. me, will you define a meta-analysis, please? Vaughn? Sure, I'm going to butcher this, I feel <laughs> like, but, um, you know, I, in the simplest possible terms, I think a meta-analysis is a tool that you can use to determine if there is um, an overall effect of a certain treatment. Let's say it's a medication, right, on um, an illness, for example. So in in our case, you know, in, in that case, you could compile multiple studies about the, the use of this medication on saying reducing the size of a tumor, right? Um, and then because you've compiled all these studies that other people have done, you can then look and see, okay, well, you know, maybe there isn't, this medication is not um, great for tumor reduction, right? Um, in our case, what we're doing is the same principle, right? So we're using this tool, um, a meta-analysis, to look at the effect of fire on insect communities, right? So we want to know, okay, well, is fire reducing or increasing insect richness or abundance? Um, so, yeah, it, it's sort of like, a, I think because the word meta and analysis are in it, it's sort of like a scary word, but it's, I really view it as just a tool for compiling information and data across studies to determine, um, you know, an average effect or a true effect of some treatment or some disturbance on whatever variable you're interested in. Yeah, that, cool. that's Thanks. really good. Yeah. Yeah. So. So then, right, I, so, so when that translates to what you guys did here, Steve, was it primarily you who reached out to different um, published author, uh, different authors who had published papers which involve fires and involve insects to see if you could use their data and you compile yeah, it all together? That that that's definitely a part of it, and you know is what Vaughn kind of said, like when there's a lot of studies that's not giving like a very direct like answer, like we don't know if this medication is good or bad for reducing a tumor. We don't know if fire is good or bad for butterflies because there's a lot of publications out there. You want to combine them all into one thing. Um, so I did a systematic literature search. Um, so I searched five different databases, um, Web of Science and Scopus uh, were the primary ones. And I searched basically fire and butterflies, you know, fire and bees. It was more, you know, defined than that. Um, but I had over 18,000 hits. So I had to go through 18,000 publications to find publications that specifically were looking at um, butterfly responses from a wildfire or prescribed fire or bee responses from a wildfire or prescribed fire. Um, and some were very obvious, like in the title, it said like bee responses from prescribed fire in you know, Southern United States, but others were like, you know, community effects from natural disturbance. So I'm like, I have to, let's read the abstract. Is that natural disturbance a hurricane or is it a fire? And then, okay, it's a fire. Are the community effects on plants or insects? Okay. It's on insects. Let me look at the insects. Oh, okay. We got orthoptera grasshoppers. That's not what we're looking for. Oh, is it on beetles? Okay. Is it ground beetles specifically? This is what I want. So that was a very time consuming process. And we found 292 publications that we could use. Um, and in order to do a meta analysis, we need their raw data. Um, so we could um, basically uh, normalize the data uh, for the meta analysis. Vaughn, I might be saying that wrong, but- Yeah, no, I think that's, that's a good explanation. Like we either needed some statistical test that we could convert to an effect size um, or the raw data that, so that we could do the test and do it ourselves. Um, and that process was a lot of pulling data from graphs that were published in the, in the publications. Um, a lot of emails that went out, um, asking people if they were willing to share their data. Um, 
And sometimes, um, every once in a while, <laughs> we would get a publication that presented it perfectly as we needed it. Um, and so those were always um, good nights when we had a bunch of those in a row. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I mean, I think the majority of the Steve mentioned two and a half years was spent quite honestly, like assembling that data set. Mm -hmm. um, that was like the biggest part of the project. Yeah, and I, big, big shout out to all the scientists out there that like were willingly able to share their data. Yeah. You know, because the scientists were like, oh gosh, what are they gonna do with our data? Are they gonna try to prove us wrong? Or are they gonna publish it themselves? Which of yeah. course is very unethical. Um, but the, I, it was well over 80% of scientists who we reached out to were like, Steve, no problem, here's the data. Yeah, um, data. I mean, it takes so much time and effort and money and, and thought to put together data, like solid scientific data in the right way. So it's very like, yeah, it just to just ask someone for their data. It's very good that they gave it to you, too, because science is best when we all collaborate and share. And you, that's what takes us to new heights. So out of so you said you reached out to like over 200 people. Or um, hundred studies. Uh, it was a little less than a hundred scientists that we reached out to because oh, we couldn't okay. find. We had two hundred ninety-two publications. Yeah. But in order to get the not all those publications had the information we were looking for, like mm -hmm. reported in the publication. So that's when we either checked the supplemental data. We looked on Dryad, which was a data archiving uh, website. Mm -hmm. um, or we just reached out to the author and said, "Hey, we want to cite you, <laughs> so please share your data." Cool. So that brings us to one of the highlights um, of your paper that you conducted a meta-analysis on 100 pyroentomology studies for three insect taxa, right? As listed on your paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. put the note for up there. And um, why we chose those taxa, sorry if I'm interrupting you, Issa. Oh, go ahead. But it's like, in order to do a meta-analysis, you need enough of a sample size in order to find something that's important or a signal. Um, and yeah. as everyone could probably imagine, butterflies are very popular. Everyone likes butterflies. They're pretty. They're easy to identify. Um, bees are kind of like the hot topic now, no pun intended, um, because of pollination and they're globally declining. Um, so we would probably die without bees. That's not hyperbole to say. Um, and then ground beetles. Um, they're very much studied when it comes to like a lot of forest management type things. Um, and they're a popular, uh, they're pretty large beetles um, and they're popular to you know to study and to collect um so that's why we chose those three insect taxa cool. because there's a lot of publications out there yeah cool um I, since we are um I, because this is live i just want to say welcome to anybody who's joining in now my name is isa benton court host of bug scope and i'm joined by von shari and dr stephen mason who are authors on a recently published article, scientific journal on, well, I'll just read the title, Responses from Bees, Butterflies, and Ground Beetles to Different Fire and Site Characteristics. So that's what we are talking about now, the effects of fire on insects. Um, and right now we are, what part are we talking about now? The, so I was thinking ahead. I could put up the summary of sort of what we found for each of those three groups. Um, sure. And right, so, be right before we do that, though, uh, will you guys explain the picture, what's in the picture that's on the screen with us at the top? Yeah. So one of the highlights that we found in looking at, you know, we found 292 publications that we could use, but really we could only get data from 100 of them. Um, and one of the highlights we found in those 100 publications is that only 7% of those publications actually quantified fire severity. Um, so in this picture, we're actually seeing everything north of that road, that's, I guess, the most of the picture, um, has had a prescribed fire. And in the green north of the road, that's a low severity fire because the canopy is still green. You could see that the orange uh, canopy is just uh, needles that um, died because of the heat. So that's a middle severity fire. And in the black there, it's a high severity fire. So it completely consumes um, everything, all the vegetation. So this picture just represents that, you know, quantifying fire severity is super important because fire severity has different effects on the vegetation. And then insects are responding to those different effects on the vegetation. So if you're not accounting for fire severity, 
chances are you're sampling in different fire severity sites, which would have different vegetation, which would have likely different effects on insect communities. So we found that was a little bit of an issue if only seven only 7% 7 of scientists quantified fire severity when fire severity could, could have uh, really big impacts on insects, if that made sense. That makes a lot of sense because different, so yeah, different severities will result in different um, like quantities of places for insects to hide and live or different like air spaces. Like if it doesn't burn up, if everything's burnt down, it's just an open giant pile of ash versus if there's still trees standing, even if they're dead, they can provide little nooks and crannies for insects to live in, things like that. Um, so that is that is a really important point that you bring up. And hopefully uh, this paper will shed light on that. And people in the future doing studies that touch upon fire entomology will include measurements of fire severity. Is that something that is that is that a guideline that you include in your paper, like how to like, what do you, do you have recommendations of how entomologists calculate this or quantify or uh, name it, name yeah, the fire there, severity? There's, there's definitely different ways to measure fire severity. Uh, we don't, we didn't recommend it in the paper. We just basically said that there's different ways to do it by satellite imagery or even just ground truthing. Um, but just quickly, like fire severity is different than fire intensity. So fire intensity is the heat energy output from an actual fire. When you hold your hand up to a candle and you feel that heat, that's fire intensity. But fire severity is measured by the loss of organic matter from before and after the fire. So you could measure the loss of organic matter, for example, canopy by satellite imagery or just by going to the field site and seeing the percentage of canopy still there. So that's a very important um, thing to note, the difference between fire severity and intensity. Cool. I'm definitely going to reach out to you, Steve, when I go to Borneo next year to ask for your um, your input on, quant on me quantifying the severity of the forest fires at the site where I'll be at, because that's something that I am gonna I, I want to take into account while I'm there. So it definitely it's funny. It will definitely like kind of touch upon. I'll definitely be thinking about your work when I'm there. So um, cool. Vaughn, cool. did you want to go over the uh, those Yeah, results? I can put up the general one really quick. Um, we might need some more space on the screen. Um, space made. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> um, and I'm actually going to bring up the larger version for myself on another screen so I can mm. see it. But um, so we, we realized that we did a lot of work. We collected a lot of studies and we made a lot of figures. Um, but this figure in particular shows sort of a, a high level summary of our results um, with respect to the variables that we talked about. So things like, is it a broadleaf forest? Is it a coniferous forest, wildfire, et cetera? Um, and the different taxa that we, did, that we studied, right? Um, so we have bees, ground beetles in the middle there, and then um, butterflies. And same order as before, you know, that left hand side, we're looking at richness, so the number of species. And in that right hand side, we're looking at the abundance of so the count data. Um, and, you know, overall, I think what stands out is, is we, in terms of the effects that were significant, um, we found a lot of positive effects um, of fire, um, regardless of the variable. Um, on richness and abundance. We did note two negative effects for butterflies, um, butterflies in coniferous forests and butterflies um, who, butterfly communities after a particularly high severity um, fire. Um, and what we also note here is, so we note all of the um, gray effects. So those were, if you remember back to the forest plot, those gray lines, um, things that you know, maybe the mean may be on either side of that line, but that line is crossing zero. Um, and those black um, squares are where we didn't have enough effects to actually analyze, um, you know, what the effect of fire and that particular variable was on um, that, that biodiversity metric. So um, one of the things moving forward that I think this paper is helpful for is like, you know, anything that's gray and anything that's black is a prime research topic, I think, right? Um, means A, we didn't have enough effects um, in, 
either case, or, um, you know, it's just something that's really understudied. Um, and so I think this figure in particular is a nice sort of roadmap moving forward into like, okay, well, you know, what do we know, you know, the blue effects, um, what do we think we know, you know, the orange effects, and then what do we want to know more about, right? The gray and, and the black boxes here. Um, I think if you don't mind me, uh, mentioning, I think that the, this touches upon something that's so important for and, and helpful for people outside of science to recognize. And that's that when a, when a scientific finding when, like is published or when research is published, it oftentimes comes with a lot more questions associated with it of where to go next. And so that's sort of what you are telling us right now, Vaughn. If someone's looking to jump into this topic and join some research, then like, here you go. It's right here, Vaughn's laying it out, where to jump in and continue the work. <laughs> Continue the yeah. story, the unfolding, the discoveries. Yeah, totally. There's always, there's always something to find. I think, and that's what's exciting about science. Yeah. And and quickly too, we found no significant negative effects on butterfly, bee, or ground beetle species richness from any of our fire and sight characteristics. So that's basically telling us that no matter what type of fire, no matter what habitat's in. Um, species richness for bees, butterflies, and ground beetles won't um, be negative, essentially. There won't be a significant negative effect. Can you, will you tell us what um, what species richness is, what richness is? Yeah, so species richness is basically how many species occur um, in an area. So let's say in my garden right now, hypothetically, there's a monarch, there's an eastern tiger swallowtail, and there's a cabbage white. So that's a species richness of three, right? Um, and abundance is the amount of individuals per per species. So right now, um, there's Issa, Vaughn, and me. So our species richness is one because we're all the same species, but our abundance is three because there's three of us. I hope that made sense. Did that? How did I do, Issa? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Okay. Um, someone asked about if there's genuinely no effect, which I think is a really interesting question. That's uh, totally you, Vaughn. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's always hard, right? Because in the ideal scenario, you would have like a huge sample size of studies. And then, um, you know, with a huge sample size, if there was genuinely an effect, you would probably detect it, right? Um, so I think as we progress in science and as we get better at quantifying fire severity and recording other fire characteristics and attributes, um, I think, you know, there is the possibility for no effect to be revealed. So if we had like a large sample size of effects going into this model and it came back and that mean was right on zero and we had a really short confidence interval, um, yeah, I think it's totally possible. Um, with a small number of effects, I would hesitate to say, um, something is neutral right off the bat. Cause again, we are talking about a disturbance to a habitat. <laughs> physically modifying attributes of the habitat. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely possible for sure. Um, cool. So are there, are there other uh, media here that you guys wanted to bring up to talk about? For example, I brought up this diagram, which is a cool like uh, diagram that you guys oh. put together for the paper. <laughs> That was our final art project at the conclusion. <laughs> it, it was actually like when we submitted the paper and we got very like positive reviews, like right off the bat, which we were excited about. But one of the reviews was like, you need to make a conceptual map of your methods. Cause we're, you know, we have like in print, like we had these different fire characteristics and blah, 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 blah. They're just like, make a, make a picture of it. So what we did was, you could see in that picture, um, there's a bee there, there's a butterfly and ground beetles, and we wanted to learn the different fire and site mechanisms and characteristics on, you know, those taxes, richness and abundance. You know, so one of the categories we had, which is in the top left, is fire type, and we split up fire type to prescribe fire and wildfire. We'd had habitat type, grassland, coniferous forest, uh, broadleaf forest. We had fire severity. Was it low severity, medium severity? or high severity. Um, and
and what's actually really interesting, I don't think we talked about it too much, um, but kind of like a, a little cherry on top to the paper was we actually looked at land management goals on top of fire. So as a land manager, did they thin the forest and then put a prescribed fire down? Did they mow a grassland and then put a prescribed fire down? So we looked at those fire effects with different land management treatments to see the overall uh, fire effect. And honestly, that's something that's really lacking in the pyroentomology literature, where it's a, it's really a field that's right for the picking. Like, what's the fire effect plus a land management treatment on insect taxa? We found very little studies for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll also mention, and this came up in the review too, is um, the importance of scale yes. in this. Um, and so... Um, a lot of the fires that we worked with, I mean, we had things that ranged from very small to very large, you know, massive wildfires. Um, when, you, that is, when you say when you say small, like like how like a playground size or like how a pool size or a football size. Yeah, what do you remember, Steve? What it, the? It's it's hard to recall like the smallest plot we had because we weren't keeping track of that. Um, yeah. And I'm gonna throw it back to you, Vaughn. But like quickly, it's like if a 10 meter by 10 meter fire was there versus a million acre wildfire, like there's going to be some differences there. Right. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, cool. So I think that is a really interesting avenue in fire ecology to explore as well. So yeah, in any ecology. <laughs> yeah. Scale is important. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left. And so I wanted to one, uh, invite viewers to ask questions, whatever questions they might have about the effects of fires on insect communities. Um, and then I also would like to ask you and uh, you, Steve and Vaughn, if you will like share some of, some of the, after doing this, like what are some takeaways that like you just would really like other people to know about this process or and then like the outcomes like what are some of those takeaways that you're like after doing this like everyone needs to know this or like everyone ought to know this about what's going on here you want to go first Vaughn? um yeah i can go first while we wait for questions to roll in uh so first off and this is not oh i guess it's science related um is it's definitely a treat to work with someone you get along with um, if i didn't like steve i don't think <laughs> uh, i would have spent two and a half years on this project <laughs> but i mean it was i we i'm not kidding when we say we really built it from the ground up like we read the meta-analysis book cover to cover together we Aww. worked through all the effects together and so it was nice like it's nice to have the positive feedback that this publication is getting, given the amount of work that we put into it. And it, it was a pleasure doing that because, mm -hmm. you know, Steve and I would just chat about personal stuff and, you know, it was, it didn't feel like work, I think. Yeah. And so it was a good time. So that was my, I think my biggest takeaway from this for sure. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah. I'll add to that and just be like, it literally like over the past, couple years it was literally hundreds of hours together at least a couple hundred hours together just just working on this if it was coding if it was just searching the publications if it was taking the next step and um it's something that i know for the future i always want to collaborate with somebody who's a friend and who's easy to get along with and we have the same goal of just having fun and doing science together and that was really supported by you know working with Vaughn on this oh. so cool um, and yeah. I guess kind of to accompany that, I'll share this photo that I took of you guys in the collection in Florida back during that International Congress of Entomology. So oh, I was full screening it. <laughs> yeah, there's Vaughn and Steve, and they are among all the butterflies of the McGuire Center in at the University of Florida in Gainesville. So good times. Yeah, yeah. fond memories. Yeah. I wish I... I wish I got a picture of all three of us because there are some of those that in existence, but didn't. Yeah, sure. Next time, yeah, yeah. <laughs> next time. Yes. We're all in like separate locations now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But... All right, popcorn, Steve. Pop popcorn, Steve. <laughs> mm -hmm. For what some takeaways of the? Uh, I, 
I well, besides working with people, I think that's a general life thing. We all want to work with somebody that we get along with. But I think the takeaway is take really good notes. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And I'm not a good note taker. But when Vaughn and I first started, we we're like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Let's just write down notes. And then like a year later, <laughs> it was like, you actually need to know the exact terms you're searching for on this exact date to see what you could find. And fortunately, like going through all these bad notes that I was taking, I, I had that information. So mm -hmm. as you're going through it, take really good notes. I think that's probably with any science. Um, so that's before the, before the, as we're going through the process, but after, I think one of the main takeaways is um, if you're studying pyro entomology or any type of fire, please quantify the fire severity. Um, I think that's a really big takeaway. Um, and the power of science, like um, we're looking forward to hearing, you know, the positive and negative feedback from this paper. The power of science is um, it's transparent. People could replicate it um, and people could pick at it. And we want to, you know, further advance this field um, from the foundation that we created. Yeah, it's like a giant discussion. Yeah, it's a communication. A publication is not set in stone. It's a communication. This is what we did. This is what we found. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's awesome. Um, okay, we have a question from David asking, were you able to see if the if effects were different in biogeographic regions? I know the fire response in if woodland in Palearctic and the, the Arctic is different, for instance. Yeah, so I can take that one. Yeah. I That is something that we wanted to do. Um, the issue with parsing things out into different biogeographic ge regions was that um, we were then narrowing or cutting the number of effects that we had. Um, and in our rule set, I think we set five as the minimum, right, Steve? Two publications of at least five effects. Yeah. So um, in almost every case, I believe, because we did look at this, um, we didn't have enough effects to, to actually do an analysis. Um, but I mean, that's all the more reason to continue studying this so that that is a potential, right? Because, you know, you're not going to expect systems everywhere to behave exactly the same. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's definitely a, a good future avenue to explore and a great question, too. It definitely shows the need of where we need more studies done, mm -hmm. for sure. So. Cool. Um, all right. So uh, now we just have a couple more minutes left. And in these final minutes, I like so to reiterate your findings on this paper, um, the bee richness and abundance was increased in most fire situations, right? And then the butterfly and ground beetle uh, richness, species richness was not changed in most situations. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Okay. Cool. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Cool. cool. Um, all right. Any any other concluding remarks that you guys want everybody to know about? I don't know the findings or. Um, like, I what, have something to, to say. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I think we're gonna keep working together in the future, and I think my biggest takeaway from this and from, you know, my other scientific project projects in general has been you know, ecology is very much not black and white. And mm. um, it's important to look for the gray area. And I think, you know, this is especially relevant when we talk about things like disturbance, where undoubtedly there can be a tragic loss of infrastructure and of human life. Um, but on the same side of things, you know, this process of disturbance can be really critical for other forms of life on the planet. So, um, you know, to not take things as wholly bad or wholly good, I think mm -hmm. is, is my takeaway from this work. Cool. Um, and I guess kind of going off of that too, like if you were to continue like the next paper based on this, I guess in a way, maybe Steve, you've done that with your dissertation. There might, there might be other parts to this that um, are in the works so that you're writing up now for publication. But like what if you chose the next study kind of launching off of this one, what is it? What are you interested in diving into 
like based on what 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 interest has this peaked i guess for what you'd want to do next related to this so definitely two things there um the first thing is you kind of mentioned it um i kind of looked at the fire severity aspect like if we do quantify fire severity will that actually show differences in insect responses and shout out to evan Waite who's in the chat uh, we looked at ground beetles um, and there are differences if we actually look at fire severity um, but something that Vaughn and I will work on, um, you know, this is for any other scientist. We'll be happy to see this if somebody else does this. But if no one does, um, the butterflies from fire effects, they were really kind of wacky, to, to say the least. Um, so we really want to go down to the family level of butterflies instead of the suborder. I think butterflies are a, a suborder. Um, so we want to do the same process, but just go more uh, taxa specific, I, taxonomically more specific. Um, to the family of butterflies. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, thanks, guys, so much for joining. Um, if viewers want to continue following you, uh, I know, Steve, you have an awesome Instagram where you share um, the world from your view when it comes to the cool organisms you come across and also your work in the Pine Barrens, hence, and of course, that's inspired your handle, Pine Barren Nat Naturalist, as well. Um, and then Vaughn is over. You can find Vaughn over on Twitter. I will put both of these into the chat. So if you guys have follow-up questions and want to get in touch with Vaughn or Steve, you can find them on social media. So yeah, thanks, guys, so much for joining the Bug Scope. It was awesome having you here and learning more about your paper. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Issa, for asking us to join. Yeah, and you're great. welcome back on the bug scope anytime. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Great. Cheers. All right.